Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. We got us a show tonight. Um, Hap Griffin has joined us. Hap comes to us from um, South Carolina, and he's got some cool stuff to show us. I've kind of seen some of these pictures before, but knowing Hap, he's got a whole lot more to show <laughs> us. Okay. Um, I want to tell you about next week, Rod Nemiroff's going to come. For those of you who would like to have an A-pod, you need to see the presentation because he's going to tell you how he picks the A-pods. It's not nearly as mysterious as you might think, you know. Um, he just looks for good pictures and stuff like that. But I don't want to tell you what he's going to talk about next week. I'll just let it be, okay? And he can, he can tell you everything he needs to tell you when it comes up. But let's get back to this week. Uh, oh, a couple other things we need to note is that um, um, we've got... Um, uh, uh, we're gonna, somebody's feeding back. It's Tolga's other computer. Okay. Um, we've got... Uh, we got Rod Nemiroff next week, and then we don't have anybody the week after that. We need some volunteers to help come present. If you've got something you'd like to share with us, please make it a point to get into it. Uh, join us on YouTube right now. Over on YouTube, we have a whole bunch of people already having a little conversation among themselves. And we've got, what, 25 people already watching. And usually that picks up in the first few minutes here. So we hope everybody's here. Now, let me tell you about tonight. We all know who Hap Griffin was. He was the guy that kind of revolutionized things. I don't know, 12, 15 years. I don't even know how, remember how old I, it, it, I, I was back then. But anyway, he um, figured out a good way to try change, convert um, um, DSLRs so that they got better red response and we could get better nebula pictures and stuff like that. And uh, unbeknownst to me, he was also a real good amateur photographer. And I invited him out to talk to us at our TMC one year. And he did that and he put on a great show. And it just it was great. And I found out all sorts about all sorts of things about him. Uh, for one thing, He's a good old boy. He's um <laughs> he's got some good stories in him, and uh, he probably won't tell them all tonight. But if you ever get to a conference with him, set him down and enjoy it. Okay, plays the guitar. Used to ride motorcycles. Don't know if he's still. I mean, he's got a whole story. He's really in real life. If there is such a thing as real life at, at this point in our lives, um, he is. Uh, uh, he was a. a engineer, broadcast engineer for South Carolina Educational Television. He's got lots of stuff going for him. Good storyteller. And I think I'll get out of the way and let him start talking. So Hap, go ahead and take over. All right. All right. Let's see what I can uh, do here. Uh, let's see. There we go. And uh, hopefully, let me get the PowerPoint up here. Here we go. Do you see that? Yep, you're good. Okay, let me bring that up full screen. Anyway, what I'm going to talk tonight about is uh, I normally am talking about astrophotography in one form or another, but this is a different type of extreme photography. Um, and that term, I think, was coined by my friend Chris Hetledge, and I'm, I'm glad to see that he's here on, uh, on uh, YouTube tonight because uh, actually one or two of these images uh, may have something to do with him. Uh, on here. So anyway, um, let's uh, get get going here and I'll try to move move forward as fast as I can through some of these. Anyway, this I am an astrophotographer, as uh, most people know, and that's my first love. And uh, I've got an observatory here in South Carolina and uh, do a, a lot of uh, astrophotography. My background, my professional background is in broadcast engineering. I was the chief engineer for South Carolina Educational Television for uh, 16 years until I retired in 2012, and now I'm back now as, a, as an engineering consultant. Uh, but one thing I've always been interested in is rockets, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight is rocket photography, which is uh, not exactly astrophotography, but it's kin to it. And uh, this is something I found not long ago. This is a... Uh, drawing out of a notebook that I had when I was six years old in the first grade. And uh, this is a schematic diagram for a liquid fueled rocket. And of course you can see the, all of the spelling errors there. And uh, 
but I was glad to find this. And that, that shows how far back my interest in, in rocketry and space travel and really all things space uh, goes uh, all the way back. I have uh, built a number of uh, high powered model rockets over the years and uh, still enjoy doing that when I can. And what got me involved in rocket launch photography was back in uh, uh, 20, at the end of 2010, uh, a friend of mine and myself decided that we were going to go see um, a shuttle launch before the shuttles totally closed out. And so we went down and uh, watched uh, uh, one of the final shuttle launches, I believe it was uh, Discovery. And um, while I was there, I was talking to my friend Chris Hetledge on the telephone and uh, he said, yeah, he was he was out at the pad and he was uh, going to go out and pick up his cameras at the pad. And I said, well, wait a minute. How how'd you get, you know, to, to photograph from out at the pad? And he said that he had uh, uh, media credentials through uh, Sky and Telescope magazine, I believe it was at the time, and said, aren't you uh, uh, involved in, in broadcasting? And I said, well, yeah, uh, I'm the vice president of a network. So uh uh, <laughs> it, it dawned on me that I could have been, uh, shooting rockets down at the Cape all along, uh, with media credentials and just never got into it. But, uh, I finally was able to, before the, the last shuttle launch, which was STS-135, I was, uh, sweating it to get my credentials in time because you go through a, uh, security process and, and processing all that sort of thing to get to, to get your security uh, clearances. And finally, I was able to get my media badge uh, for that launch. The uh, center of operations for the news media is, uh, is the NASA News Center, which is uh, right outside of in front of the vehicle assembly building uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. And this is where we, uh, all of the photographers, uh, meet and chat and uh, get information from NASA and interface with NASA. And uh, we have uh, desks where we can return uh, uh, data and uh, stories back to uh, whatever news media you're working for. That's me in the on the floor down there in the in the uh, red shirt um, after a launch. And uh, out in front of uh, the old countdown clock, which you've probably seen on television a hundred times over the years through the 60s and 70s, that, that's no longer there. Uh, it's been replaced with a, a more high-tech clock, but uh, I wanted to get a picture of uh, with that before they retired it. Anyway, before you uh, take cameras out to, uh, to the launch sites, uh, you obviously have to go through a security check. They want to make sure you're not going to take any explosives out there or anything that would be dangerous to the to the rocket. So uh, you have to lay all your equipment out and uh, get it checked by uh, guard dogs that come in and sniff for explosives and all this sort of thing. And one of the things about this that's so interesting to me is that uh, if you've ever been to Florida, you know that it rains almost every day. And uh, many times we, we are required to set our cameras up the day before a launch and they'll be out overnight. And sometimes if there's scrubs, they'll be out there multiple days. So we have to weatherproof our cameras and there's all sorts of different uh, methods of doing that. You'll see people with cameras in mailboxes and Tupperware and uh, uh, tackle boxes and homemade wooden boxes, all this sort of thing. So this is one of the things that interests me a lot is the the fact that uh, so much of the equipment that we use out at the pads has to be home fabricated because you just don't find uh, some of the things that we need. But anyway, this was before the launch of STS-135. When I got out to the pad to set up, this is what what I saw. And um, uh, I was so proud to be there <laughs> the first time. And uh, uh, I was just, just on cloud nine. Uh, this was uh, one of the cameras that I set up that day. You'll see a couple of things here. The box that's strapped to the tripod leg, that's the sound sensor. Uh, a lot of people ask, how do we uh, trigger these cameras if we're not there uh, 
on site. Obviously, you can't stand that close to a rocket launch. It would the sound pressure waves would would literally uh, scramble your your insides. And so uh, we do it by remote um, sensing. Uh, in this case, with still cameras, we generally use sound sensors that that sense the start of the rocket engines and uh, start clicking continuously until the sound goes away. Um, we also have to tie down our, our equipment. Uh, NASA requires us to stake it down to make sure that the tripods don't go flying. And uh, you'll see that we, in this case, I was tied down with a dog stake there and a bungee cord as well as tent stakes on each tripod leg. And that's pretty typical. Uh, and then you have to waterproof it. And this is one quick and easy way of doing it. You just put a trash bag over it and tape up all the, the, the openings. Um, and that works pretty well. Uh, it, you have to sort of dress for the occasion because this is in the middle of a swamp. Uh, the, the launch pads at uh, Complex 39, actually all of the launch sites down there, are literally on the uh, stone's throw from the ocean. And so there's lots of bugs, lots of mosquitoes, uh, and it's uh, marshy in a lot of places. This guy has on uh, uh, boots, which is a, a good idea. And uh, matter of fact, this is uh, this might be a picture of Chris if he's listening. Uh, this is some of the guys that Chris was with setting up over in some bushes uh, for this launch, and uh, uh, just shows what you have to go through. Now you have to remember also that you're a lot of times you're around standing water, and there's alligators everywhere. Uh, so you have to watch out for the wildlife. There's turtles. There's snapping turtles, there's alligators, uh, all sorts of things that you have to be on the lookout for. But anyway, this was uh, the, the shuttle uh, the night before on the pad. And uh, then the launch uh, the next morning was uh, uh, almost washed out by weather. Uh, this is to show some of the media in the, in the parking lot of the NASA News Center. Um, it was cloudy that morning and we were pretty much all thinking that the launch was going to be scrubbed. And, um, there's the CNN booth, uh, there. And, uh, but at the last minute, the, uh, the shuttle did take off, uh, through a hole in the clouds, basically just a, a what, you know, a sucker hole is what we would call it as astrophotographers. And, and it was a successful launch. Um, and it was awesome. <laughs> I was absolutely hooked at this point. The sound level is uh, something to be uh, just unbelievable. It shakes, literally shakes the clothes uh, on your body. And uh, uh, it's, it's something that once you experience it from a site that's fairly close like this. At this point, we were three miles away at the NASA News Center, which is as close as as uh, people can be to the launch, uh, a lot closer than the general public, but still as close as anybody can can be uh, because of the potential for an accident on the pad. And uh, this is all news media. This is not the general public. This is all news media that was at this last launch. And there was just hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of news media from all over the world there. This is... Uh, uh, picture. This is not from my camera. This was from Chris Hetledge's camera. Uh, my camera ended up um, uh, failing because uh, I had set the sound sensor too sensitive. And the night before we had a rainstorm and the rain caused the uh, sound trigger to go off all night long. And so I had like 10,000 pictures of the shuttle sitting in the, in the rain on the pad. And by the time the shuttle launched the next day, my battery was dead. So I didn't get anything out of that first launch, but this was this was what was was seen from a camera that was very close to mine. Anyway, this is some of the tools that we use. First of all, are we am I getting out OK, uh, Alex? Can you give me some indication? Yes, sir. Uh, you're you coming across fine. Yeah, you're, oh. you sound fine. Hey, uh, see that little um, white bar where it says uh, Oh, hide. hide. Okay. Pick that off, and we, that way we'll see y'all. There we All go. right. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Everything's going fine. Chris is uh, bragging about how. Oh, yeah. I helped. <laughs> I helped uh, Hap do this. I helped Hap do this. No, he oh, said, yeah, "Yeah, that's my butt. That was my butt in that picture." Anyway, that, back yep. to you, Hap. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the tools that we use. Um, 
we use uh, basically sound triggers on the still cameras and timers on the video cameras. Um, and most everything is homemade. This is the ones that I build using some little timers that you can get off of eBay. And I basically strip the guts out of the, the timer and um, build it onto a little battery pack that uh, uh, that makes it uh, work with, with all the devices that we need. I'm a ham radio operator and an engineer, so I build everything. This is my workbench at the house. And uh, showing some of the timers and, and uh, uh, battery packs that, uh, that I put together for the cameras. Uh, this is one of the sound sensors, uh, the internals. And the last thing I do uh, at the hotel room each night uh, before carrying the, the uh, equipment out to the pad the next morning is to calibrate all the clocks, set all the clocks uh, exactly on time. Um, the video cameras are set to, uh, to start recording a minute or two before the launch window opens uh, and to shut down after the launch window closes. Um, if there's uh, if it's a night launch or a uh, morning early morning launch, you're going to have fog and dew, and so I've got dew heaters on lenses that I have to turn on for an hour or so before the launch window opens to uh, heat up the lenses enough to where there's not dew on the lenses, that sort of thing. So there's all sorts of things that you have to make sure that are that are right before um, before uh, showtime. Anyway, this is a, a common weather enclosure made out of some Tupperware stuff from Walmart. It works really well. Uh, and this is typical of one of my still cameras. And I use some little Mobius uh, video cameras. These are the coolest little things. They're only like $80 on uh, Amazon and they shoot 1080p video. I'll show you some video from these in a few minutes. And uh, they, they record sound and uh, shoot 1080p video. And um, what, what I like about them is that they uh, are triggerable remotely by just applying five volts to the USB connector. You, there's a mode that you can put them in to where you apply five volts to the USB connector and it starts recording. And so that makes it operation from a timer really easy. Um, this is typical of... Uh, of camera setup day, everybody's out setting up their cameras and, and actually taking pictures of the rockets on the pad. Uh, this is uh, some security checks uh, that we all go through. What's funny though, is that NASA is a whole lot more uh, uh, security conscious, I, I would suppose uh, you could say, that's probably not the, the right word, but the, uh, the military is not quite as as uh, stringent as NASA is. This is a billion dollar spy satellite on top of a Delta IV Heavy in the background. And that's my car sitting down there. That's my Jeep Grand Cherokee there with the ULA sign on the side of it. Uh, and I'm working right out of the back of my car. Uh, when we go for NASA launches, generally we have to to uh, shove all of our equipment inside of a NASA bus and they take us out to the pads. But for the Air Force launches, uh, a lot of times we can actually drive our cars right to the pads, which is uh, strange, but, but I love it because then you don't have to carry your equipment quite so far. This is uh, some of the guys that I work with. What I was gonna show this about is that little camera. Let's see if I can bring my arrow up here. This. This was an experiment. One of the things that uh, uh, the guys were talking about since the first time I started shooting out there was, wouldn't it be neat if we could track the rocket up rather than just setting the camera to show the rocket on the pad. And once it leaves the pad and goes out the picture, it's gone. And um, so everybody was talking about, uh, uh, it would be cool if we could do some sort of a tracking mount. And I got to thinking, well, telescopes, you know, uh, using a, an inexpensive telescope mount and some sort of an infrared sensor, I could probably whip this up. And so another friend of mine who's into Arduino microprocessor programming and I came up with this device. This is a, uh, a cheap, inexpensive uh, telescope um, alt as mount and we're just using the, the altitude motor in it. This is a, uh, a weather enclosure from Lowe's and it's got an infrared sensor that a uh, little infrared camera that we bought off of eBay. And uh, it senses the, the centroid of uh, brightness of the flame 
and uh, issues corrections or issues commands to the uh, to the motor drive over here and follows the rocket up. And this is one of the little Mobius cameras just duct taped to the top of it. And it uh, turned out to work pretty well after about three or four iterations of, of software, I was able to get it to work. And I'll show you that uh, in, a, uh, in, in some of the videos when we get there. The NASA guys, when they saw that, they thought, you know, doggone, it took us a million dollars to do that. And you did it with stuff from Lowe's and eBay. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> they were kind of impressed about that. But anyway, this shows uh, one of the tracking cameras at the Atlas launch site. And uh, this is over at one of the Delta sites, uh, pad, um, uh, one of the Delta the pads, and um, uh, shows some of the guys that are setting up. And we get pretty close. You can see how high up the cameras are aiming there. Um, and we're right at the base of this this huge rocket. That's up until the uh, uh, the uh, rocket by SpaceX, uh, the Falcon 9 Heavy, this was the biggest rocket in the world, and uh, the Delta IV Heavy. And these are awesome to see launch. And um, uh, this is actually getting pretty close to the, to the base of it. Uh, uh, and we've had some carnage in the cameras, and I'll show you some of that uh, shortly. But uh, I love going and setting up at these places. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. And uh, just being there at the most high tech place on the planet is uh, something that you just, you just never forget. And uh, being able to work around these things. Here's a, a sign, don't feed the alligators. I mean, there's alligators everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a natural wildlife uh, uh, haven down there. And you, people ask sometimes, how close up to the rockets do we set cameras? And we set them pretty darn close sometimes. Uh, this is a result sometimes, too. This was uh, some rockets that, uh, I mean, some cameras that got uh, damaged from the Delta IV, one of the Delta IV heavy launches. Um, some of the carnage uh, when tripods that were strapped down actually do go flying. And even road signs that get, get blown around by the exhaust from these these huge things. This is a melted plastic bag on a camera. Um, this this shows that uh, how the heat from the rocket blast just instantly melts, uh, turns the plastic to to liquid uh, around a camera. Uh, fortunately, you can peel it off, and it doesn't. The camera is not much worse for the wear. Um, but anyway, this was this was a friend of mine's um, decided that he was going to set up up on the pad, looking straight up at the rocket, and straddle the actual uh, fence up on the up on the pad. And you can see here's here's before and after pictures. And here, this this picture, you can see just as the engines are igniting, that little spot right there is his camera on the the railing. And of course, afterwards, the camera is gone. It was nowhere to be found, but we actually did find it later on. And this was the picture that he was able to uh, to to get. So you you take your chances, and sometimes it works out really really well. Um, I think he probably lost a lens on that one, but you can see he's straddling the fence here. This is the the actual uh, fence uh, that the tripod was straddling, and uh, he was looking almost straight up. So here's the rockets that we that we launch that we uh, that we shoot. Here's the Atlas V at Launch Complex 41. This is this is probably one of the most famous launch sites in the world. This is where the Voyager series was launched from. Uh, many famous uh, interplanetary probes that are that are still out in the solar system were launched here. This is now an Atlas pad. Uh, it launches uh, United Launch Alliance launches their Atlas rockets here. Uh, this is one showing a, a, a large payload adapter at the top. Excuse me. This is uh, the Mars uh, Curiosity rover that's packaged up in the top of that uh, payload bay. This was back in 20, at the end of 2011, uh, preparing for the launch of the Curiosity Mars rover. And of course, Curiosity has been on the surface of Mars now for several years. Um, again, Here's some of the, the atlases. These are some of the guys that I, I work with down there from various media outlets. And uh, 
sometimes it's it's hot and sticky down there in the Florida sun. Um, but during the winter time, it's really nice. You can go and be in shirt sleeves down there uh, working. Here's an actual launch of an atlas, one of my images. The uh, uh, this is about thirty thousand gallons of water that's thrown up just about instantly from the uh, atlas launch. Some close-ups there. And I've got some video that I'll show in a few minutes uh, once we get through the slide presentation. Night launches are always a challenge because of the huge contrast. Uh, and usually you end up with uh, with dew that has settled on your lenses and you've got to burn that off before launch time. So uh, uh, you have to be dealing with dew heaters and, and all that sort of thing. This is the launch of the uh, 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 Curiosity Mars rover. This made the centerfold of Sky and Telescope magazine uh, the following month. Now the Delta IV is launched on a different pad, pad 37. 37 used to be, or was built originally as, uh, as a Saturn pad. It launched uh, all of the Saturn 1s and 1Bs, uh, Apollo 7. Uh, some of the early Apollos were launched from this pad, uh, but then it was changed over to be a, a Delta pad for launching Delta rockets. This is one with four strap-on solid boosters. And you can see the business end there. There's somebody's camera right here <laughs> that that's about to take a licking and keep on ticking, hopefully. This is one of my images here of uh, of launch and the, the brightness of these things is unbelievable, even in the daytime. SpaceX, uh, they've taken over Complex 40 um, and uh, for, as their Falcon pad. Now they're on, they also, also have taken over Complex 39 B, uh, excuse me, 39A, and converted it into a uh, Falcon pad as well for their Falcon heavies. That's uh, SpaceX's Dragon capsule. Somebody asked me what these towers are for, and those are lightning protection. Those are lightning rods, basically, to keep lightning from striking the, the rocket on the pad. There's a SpaceX in the horizontal position, a SpaceX Falcon 9 in the horizontal position that back behind me there. And uh, this one made uh, made a couple of magazines as well. The Delta IV Heavy, like I said, that's basically three Delta IVs that are strapped together. And up until recently was the largest um, rocket in the world or the most, most heavy lift rocket in existence. Um, we, uh, I got a chance to go out uh, and reset cameras one morning after a scrub just before sunrise, and uh, the lighting was really nice on on the rocket that morning. It's a huge, huge vehicle. It's uh, very impressive. Three, basically, three rockets that are strapped together. One thing about the deltas that uh, is interesting is they, they do a hydrogen purge before launch and uh, the hydrogen, uh, they ignite the hydrogen and it flares in a, uh, a huge yellow uh, hydrogen flame ball that runs up the side of the rocket and actually scorches the, the, uh, the side of the rocket before it takes off and uh, makes for some interesting, interesting uh, scenes. You'll see some, uh, some of the live launch videos in a few minutes when I get there. And seeing a rocket just hanging in the air that is that huge is an awesome sight. It takes off very slow like a, like a Saturn V used to. And you can see the scorch marks on the side of it there from the hydrogen flares. This was... Uh, last August or, or August a year and a half ago uh, of the Parker solar probe launch that's now in orbit around the sun. It was a night launch. And of course it's, again, it's very hard to, to shoot that much contrast at night and get the exposure right. 
And one thing that always happens is it catches the grass on fire. Um, so um, we go back out and usually the fire trucks are there putting out grass fires and, and things around the, the pad there on uh, pad 37. Um, you can see the scorched grass there. Uh, the flame trench actually goes back across a road and the flame uh, shoots across the top of the ground and actually blows the fence down every time. And uh, they don't want you to take pictures of this, but I did. Uh, but uh, they come in immediately and fix this fence back. But you can see it literally uh, melts the wire off of the, the fence posts and bends the fence posts over. Uh, and so they have to repair that after every launch. Uh, here's some uh, images of the SpaceX Falcon Heavy. This was uh, the first launch of this was in February of 2018. And uh, this is where uh, Elon Musk was launching his uh, his car, his uh, his Tesla Roadster is in the top of this uh, this rocket, and that was uh, that was quite a sight. The uh, the crowds down there were uh, almost like the Apollo days. It was it was unbelievable the crowds that were there to to see this rocket launch. Uh, this is the business end of the rocket. Twenty seven engines, twenty seven Merlin engines. Uh, on this rocket that have to all work perfectly. It's an amazing machine. One thing that was interesting was uh, uh, a friend of mine and myself were there uh, on the uh, at the NASA News Center and uh, were uh, let me close this out and were oops that's not what I meant to do here. Let me go back to. PowerPoint. We were um, sitting on the side of the turn basin there uh, where they bring in the barge of the big large parts of the rockets uh, on barges and uh, a news media uh, person came up and had been listening to us talking. We were just talking rocket science, you know, and and uh, she said, I've, I've, I've over, been overhearing your conversation. I'd like to put a wireless mic on you and pick up uh, some of the uh, stuff you're talking about uh, for a news story we're doing. I said, sure. And so we, she mic'd, mic'd me up and, and uh, a few minutes later she came over and said, I'd like to do an interview. So uh, ended up uh, being on uh, uh, Spectrum cable all over Florida that night. Uh, <laughs> I didn't expect to see, I've got about four days worth of, worth of beard there and uh, wasn't expecting to be on TV that day, but uh, it was fun and it worked out pretty nicely. This is uh, one of my shots uh, from the side of the rocket. You really don't see the three uh, boosters that are stuck together there because that's in line with them, but uh, it was an awesome launch. And one thing that was funny was, um, you know, the sound triggers uh, on the camera are uh, they, they go off with, with loud sounds, they, they start clicking. And when I went out to uh, check my uh, images that were on the, the, the camera, I had uh, one extra image that uh, with, with no rocket sitting on the pad. And I thought, what is this? And it turns out that the time code on it was uh, eight minutes after launch. And it turns out that, that it was this, it was the, the boosters that were coming back in for a landing nearby and the sonic boom from the boosters coming down triggered my camera uh, again and I got one last um, one last image of the rocket sitting there on the pad or the, the pad sitting there but once we uh, got done with uh, shooting the the uh, launch I went back inside to the NASA News Center and this is what was up on the screen live video from the Tesla Roadster in orbit around the earth and it was uh, that was an awesome thing to to see. There's some YouTube videos on this. If you get a chance, take check it out. It's it's pretty cool. One of the things that's really neat is going behind the scenes. There, uh, media gets invited to all sorts of events. Um, usually, when they before they close out a spacecraft to uh, package it up and send it to the pad, they invite the news media in to take photographs in the clean room. And this was the uh, Mars Maven orbiter uh, several years ago. It's been in orbit now around Mars for, for a couple of years, studying Mars's atmosphere. And uh, I got to go into the clean room and, uh, and photograph it. This is uh, 
the uh, MMS uh, spacecraft, which is actually four different spacecraft that were launched as one, but they split into four pieces and they're in orbit around the uh, the Earth and they're monitoring the, the, uh, the solar flares and the uh, magnetic field of the Earth and how it's affected by the uh, solar wind from, from the sun. So going into the clean rooms uh, is, is pretty special. And uh, like I say, I'm gonna be going in to see the Mars 2020 rover uh, here in a couple of months. This was uh, this is the new James Webb telescope. Just a schematic of of, of it uh, right now. It's uh, going to be what what replaces Hubble uh, eventually when it launches. And I was able to go uh, a couple of years ago to um, Goddard Space Flight Center and see the last segment of its mirror being put into place. And this this is the the mirror. This is looking across one of the work pads in the clean room. This is the mirror right here of the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is some of the electronics uh, of, of the telescope that are uh, being put together. This is one of the test fixtures at Goddard Space Flight Center. This is their thermal uh, vacuum chamber, <clears throat> excuse me, where they uh, put uh, the, uh, the main equipment bus in there and uh, take it down to a vacuum and they can cook it at various temperatures and and basically subject it to uh, to a space environment to uh, test things out. Um, you get to go behind the scenes and see all sorts of things. This is uh, the original Orion capsule being built. This is Bob Cabana, who was the, uh, he was a shuttle astronaut. He's also the, uh, the, uh, the head of Kennedy Space Center. And of course, I, look, I got to climb around up on the uh, scaffolding and, and look at all of the, being an engineer, I like to look at all the wiring and, and the harnesses and all this sort of thing. This is the service module for Orion. This is the new CS-100 made by Boeing. This was, uh, it just took its first test flight here recently. And this was the, the insides of it uh, before, the, uh, before, before it had been finished. And I shot this, I included this, um, this image, this was uh, the space shuttle from here in South Carolina uh, back uh, a long time ago. This was a night launch that I was able to shoot from, from here in South Carolina, just about exactly 400 miles north of uh, Kennedy Space Center. And if you get a good, good clear horizon to the south, we could always see shuttle launches, the ones at night anyway. <clears throat> and uh, this one happened to be uh, the shuttle Endeavor going up and uh, I included that because um, it turns out I didn't know when I was shooting this, but I was going to be able to eventually go inside of Endeavor. And uh, so as they were closing out the shuttles uh, in 2012, I was able to, I got invited to go in and photograph the inside of, uh, of Endeavor and, uh, and also uh, Atlantis. This is Endeavor inside of the, the uh, servicing facility. Uh, it's payload bay open. This is the business end back where the engines uh, go. The engines had uh, already been removed. They removed the engines every flight and rebuild them basically and put it all back together. But this is the, uh, what you're seeing there is, is this end right here. Uh, these are the hydraulic jacks that uh, maneuver the engines uh, both horizontally and vertically. Well, what was amazing to me is that the entire engine bolts onto eight bolts right here on this bulkhead. And that uh, each engine is putting a half a million pounds of thrust forward. And this is the bulkhead that takes that half a million pounds of thrust. These two uh, pipes here and here are the fuel lines for the, uh, for the uh, oxidizer and the fuel and uh, again, like I say, these green things are the, the plungers, the hydraulic rams that, that steer the engines. But uh, getting back into the engine compartment to see this kind of thing was, uh, was for an engineer, is a dream come true. And uh, being able to crawl around underneath uh, the shuttle, these are some of the tiles showing some of the, the wear and tear from reentry. And then we got to go inside. And this was, uh, this was quite a... Uh, 
uh, an event for me. I was able to crawl around inside. They had some of the covers off of the avionics. And uh, again, as an engineer, I was studying the wire harnesses and, and how they, uh, uh, you know, things went from here to there and one thing to another. This is in the, the mid deck of the shuttle. And then I got to crawl out into the payload bay, go through the, uh, the airlock into the payload bay. And this is the payload bay of Endeavor. This is where the Hubble Space Telescope was serviced on its first service mission. I can remember um, <clears throat> watching that on TV and um, when the, the Canada arm grabbed the, uh, the Hubble and they said, uh, we have a firm grip on Mr. Hubble's telescope. Uh, and then they pulled it into this payload bay. Uh, this is up in the, uh, up in the flight deck. And of course I had to get in the, the pilot seat and get, uh, get the money shot there. And I, I tell the story about when I was a kid, uh, again, I was always interested in, in rockets and just fascinated with space travel. And, uh, my dad, uh, was a, a policeman and he worked next door to a, uh, uh, an appliance store. And the best thing he could ever do was to bring me home a refrigerator box to play in. And I would uh, cut portholes in it and draw controls on the inside. And I would just stay in those boxes for hours playing like I was in a spaceship. And, and you know, then later on to uh, get to sit in the pilot seat of a, of a, uh, of, of a real spacecraft that had flown 25 missions uh, I was that six-year-old kid again, uh, sitting there at the controls, and it was it was just awesome, just absolutely awesome. Uh, something I'll always remember. Then another time, I got to uh, spend a couple of hours, uh, basically by myself with Atlantis. Uh, I was uh, a scheduling issue uh, at a launch uh, site uh, had me picking up cameras when everybody else was uh, touring the space shuttle. And, uh, when I got back to the NASA news center, I said, Hey, you know, I, I drove here all the way from South Carolina and I really would like to get over there and shoot some pictures of, of Atlantis. And they put me in a little car and took me over there and said, here, have at it. And, uh, so I was able to spend a couple of hours in the VAB with Atlantis, uh, uh, just about by myself and, uh, get some good close up pictures of, uh, of Atlantis. the business in there. And of course I had to take this. This was uh, me looking out at a tour on the other side of the fence. <laughs> this, uh, uh, these guys, that was the public uh, tour that had come through the building and they were looking at Atlantis, but I was on the back side of the fence. So I was, uh, I had to grab this picture while I was there. And uh, another time uh, they were uh, at, during the closeout of, uh, of the shuttles, uh, the Endeavor and Atlantis were going to be parked on the runway uh, outside of the VAB um, at the same time. And so we got to go down and and uh, get some images of this. This is something that you don't see very often. There's two shuttles that are parked nose to nose. And uh, so I had to get a, get a profile picture with that. That's my Facebook profile picture. And... Uh, the other thing is I, I love going out to the pads. This was back when pad 39A was still um, as it was during the shuttle launch periods. It's been totally stripped now uh, and is set up as a, uh, a almost a bear pad for the uh, uh, SpaceX Falcon 9s now. But this is back when it was still set up for, um, for the shuttle. And uh, going down into the flame trench and seeing the the bottom of the of the um, flight of the launch platform. Uh, this is you can just imagine the violets that uh, uh, that was in the 87 shuttles launched from this uh, this pad, as well as all of the manned Saturn V's that went to the moon. So this this is probably the most historic place on the face of this planet, and uh, I, just, I just love to go out there and spend time when I can. It's just, just an awesome experience. Then um, when the 
and when Endeavour was getting ready to leave Kennedy Space Center and fly to California for the last time, or be transported to California, to the California Science Center for the last time um, to be displayed, uh, I was able to go down and shoot pictures of it being loaded onto the back of a of a 747 for its flight out to California. And they literally pick it up, they pull a, set, a specially designed 747 in underneath it and set it down and hook it together. And this is how they uh, they load the shuttles on the backs of these uh, <clears throat> these two specially made 747s that NASA has. And uh, they always, always said, you know, uh, if they charge me $25 for a, an extra bag, I'm going to call BS on that because this is, this is quite an extra load here that these planes can handle. Uh, but anyway, the VAB is an, is it itself is a very interesting thing. Uh, always has interested me. It's a, the, you know, used to be the largest building on earth volume wise still pretty much is. This is some pictures from back in the day, uh, <clears throat> back in the Saturn days when the Saturn moon ships were, were stacked inside of the VAB, and uh, those really must have must have been the times. But uh, then later it was used for stacking the shuttle. This is what it looks like today. Um, it's being modified now for the new SLS rocket. Uh, High Bay Three is um, is being modified to uh, be able to take an even heavier an even larger rocket than, than the Saturn V was. They are upgrading all the cranes. Uh, they're upgrading the, uh, the crawlers. Uh, this is inside the elevator going up to the, to the roof of the, the VAB. I love shooting from up on the roof. Uh, you don't get to go up onto the roof of the VAB very often, but uh, it's the tallest building in Florida. You're up 525 feet when you're there. And it's a it's a nice place to shoot from. But the problem is that they don't ever let more than thirty people on the roof at one time, <clears throat> because um, if a rocket was to blow up on the pad and they had this noxious gas cloud coming, they could only get thirty people off the roof by the time the cloud would get there because of the tight elevator. So they only allow a few people up at a time. And so getting on the list to get up there and photograph is pretty special. This shows uh, the crawler way going out to pad 39A from the roof. The crawler itself is is quite a, uh, a, a machine. It's uh, one of the largest moving machines on Earth. Uh, they were built back in the Saturn V days and used to transport the entire Saturn V stack with the, uh, with the launch tower and the launch platform and everything out to the pads. Um, and the shuttle periods, uh, they were used for that as well. This is the, the special roadway, the crawler way. This is, these are rocks from a special river in, uh, I believe it's Mississippi or either Alabama. <clears throat> and it's a certain type of quartz that does not spark when it's crushed. And so they use, uh, use that rock as the bed of the, uh, the crawler way. This is uh, the new launch tower for the SLS rocket. Uh, and uh, it's being modified now, or just actually it was modified for the SLS, and I got to go up on it a few years back and take pictures. This is from the top of it, and uh, it was quite a, quite a sight to see the whole Kennedy Space Center from on top of a launch tower. One of the other things is meeting meeting the guys down there, meeting NASA. This is Dr. Jim Green, who has become a pretty good friend of mine. He he is in charge of every interplanetary spacecraft that's out in the solar system right now. All the the Voyagers, um, uh, Cassini, all of the the different uh, uh, any any interplanetary spacecraft that's still active is under his uh, his uh, department and. Uh, Getting sitting and, and talking with him uh, is is really a special experience, and uh, uh, that's one of the things I really love about being able to do that. So I've got uh, a little bit of time here. I may have to take a quick break here, Alex, but let me uh, kick out of uh, uh, see if I can kick out of here and go back to uh, figure out how to do this here.
Let's see. What do I do here, Alex? What are you trying to do here? You're trying, trying to, to get your movies? No, yeah, I can I can show you some movies here quickly. Okay. Let's do, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, all you do is you just <laughs> on your movies as if you were just watching them on your all right. screen. Here is a uh, up-close video of uh, the NROL. This is a, a spy satellite on uh, a Delta IV Heavy from one of my up-close video cameras. What kind of camera is this? This is the little Mobius camera. Okay. What's the little black particles flying around? Just everything? Yeah. Grass, dust, dirt, everything. <laughs> That's from uh, one of the little uh, 1080p Mobius cameras. They're about the size of a book of matches or a hmm. little box of matches. Very small. It's only an $80 camera. Does that include the lens and everything? Yes. How far away is it from the launch pad right now? I'm sorry, what was the question? How, how far away was that camera from the pad? Uh, probably 150 feet, something like wow. that. Yeah. I, I remember being at Vandenberg on just a simple satellite launch. It wasn't a big, big, uh, you know, it was a small rocket, relatively small. Right. Rocket. Here's one of my tracking mounts. This was, I think, one of the first times I got it to work. Even from a mile and a half away, it was deafening, and the the quality of the light was so bright. We didn't, we didn't get to see the uh, video on YouTube. Say that again? Uh, we couldn't see the video. We could swap swap it over to your, when, uh, your screen. When Alex talks, it switches to his face instead of the video. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Here's another tracking video. Um, uh, and this one, I think, worked probably the best of the ones that I've gotten so far. And again, uh, NASA said, you know, hey, it took us a million dollars to to do that. So uh, I was I was kind of uh, uh, kind of how do you test, how do you test uh, your various rigs like the the sound uh, trigger and the light trigger and stuff like that? How, how do you test those? Let me see if I can get back to my camera here. First of all, how do I do this, Alex, to where it gets to me and I can answer some questions? Okay, first off, reshow that video while we're not talking because when we talk, we interrupt your video. So reshow that video for people that will last one you, you say. And when okay. the one the one that uh, you didn't yeah. talk during the last one, but I'll show the mm -hmm. uh, let's see the the first one here. Uh, where is it? Here's one.
You guys could talk. Uh, I locked the video on Hap. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Hap, I've got a question. The uh, camera, are they taking individual stills that you put together into a movie, or is it a, a movie? It's, not, it's video. It's a movie. Okay. Th thank you. Hap, there was a comment over on YouTube, I think several uh, people saying they have to get themselves a press pass. Say that again? Uh, people who say they have to get themselves a press pass. Yeah, yeah well, you have to be, um, you have to uh, actually work for a, vo a bona fide uh, press outlet that's doing space coverage. Uh, and then you go through a uh, security check and, uh, and you can generally, uh, if you can meet those criteria, you can you can get access. Here is uh, here's one. Somebody asked me uh, before if I ever lose any lenses or anything like that. So here's one where I actually lost a lens. This is the Osiris Rex launch from 20 uh, November. Uh, excuse me, September of 2016. Osiris Rex is just about ready to. Uh, it's in orbit around the asteroid Bennu right now, and it's getting ready to take a sample and return it to Earth. But this is the launch. And uh, one thing that to watch for is that this was an odd configuration of an atlas. It only had a single strap-on booster, which meant that it had offset thrust, and it sort of crabbed its way up. But that what that did was uh, I set my cameras at, a lot of times at, at a particular spot right beside the flame trench. And, uh, uh, but in this particular case, the offset thrust threw a lot of the water uh, the cooling water out of the trench right on to my camera. And so this camera two here got drenched. So you'll see that in this, uh, this launch. The video from these little $80 cameras is not bad. This next camera is the one who, uh, the one that gets drenched. And the problem is, is that by the time I got out to pick up the camera, the, uh, the caustic chemicals in the exhaust uh, residue had etched the lens pretty badly. Yeah. Once the dust, the smoke clears, you can kind of see the the pad. The the lens is covered in in liquid. And it just sits there and etches over time. Uh, I'll show you one or two more here. And then uh, let's see. Uh, this was the SpaceX Falcon Heavy launch, uh, February of 2018. This is the one that's carrying the uh, Tesla Roadster. Now, one thing to watch for is um, the camera that's beside mine over here. Look at this. Watch this plastic cover when the when the shock waves from the launch hit it.
This is from a different angle. You know, it looks like it's leaving a dark trail where it passes through as if it did something to the sensor as it went through. I think that's, uh, that's exhaust gases. All of this white, so. white stuff no. down here is nothing but steam. Right. Okay. Yeah. You got to say that's exhaust up there. Okay. Right. Um, and that's about, uh, well, that's cool. I've got, I've got other stuff here. How can I, I kick uh, back to put your put your cursor up in the left hand corner until it just stop sharing i think right isn't that how you stop sharing up in the right hand corner where the three dots are i don't see I three, dots. three dots the three dots aren't showing up you need to go back to the browser window where the phone call is happening oh, yeah. There, you go. there you go we see a app all right but i don't see myself here <laughs> Um, you're good. We can see you. No, are uh, yeah. What do you? Well, did you, did you reopen the? Like, okay, so here we go. Okay. Yeah, you're live. Okay, I see it. All right, that's it. Okay. Uh, I don't know that we. Oh, we had some discussion about the camera. Um, all those, all the pictures you took, are saved locally on the camera. Correct. They are right. Okay. So I have to go back out to the pad to uh, to pick up the cameras afterwards. It's usually a couple of hours. That's an SD That's card a, or something. Yeah, it's in an SD card. That's right. Okay. You can't have anything that transmits wirelessly out at the pads because uh, of the sensitivity of the electronics on the rockets, uh, specifically the spy satellites, uh, that sort of thing. They uh, they forbid you to. You can't even take your cell phones out. They they collect your cell phones before you go. Hmm. Oh, uh, there's a couple of, I think, who was it, oh, McCallum or somebody up there, um, who said it, uh, you know, you're kind of living the dream that many of us have, and we really want to thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, well, it, it is. I, like I say, as a kid, I was always wanting to be in the space, pro involved in the space program in some, some way, fashion, or form, and uh, uh, I'm doing it vicariously now through through photography access. So uh, that's that's uh, about as close as I'm going to get, but uh, I, I sure do enjoy it. Yeah. I don't see any other specific questions. This was mostly a night for us just watching and seeing how it went. So um, has anybody else got anything for tonight before we check out? Uh, how, how many launches do they have in an average year? Um, Lately, it's been uh, one or two a month. Uh, matter of fact, SpaceX right now is getting ready to, uh, I think, have their third or fourth launch in one month. Uh, it's really picking up now, and uh, uh, it, it, the the it, and now, especially since we start carrying uh, Americans back up uh, later this year, uh, so the activity along the space coast has really picked up here lately. As an astrophotographer, you have any comments or thoughts about the Starlink launch? <laughs> well, um, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, as you know, it's not too awful bad to do uh, statistical stacking and get rid of uh, rogue pixels and, and streaks through individual frames. So hopefully, you know, we'll be able to use the tools that we have available to us to uh, keep on doing what we love to do. Let me see if I've got this picture I can show you all. Yeah, I do. Let me uh, try to share a screen here. Um, how do I go about doing that? I'm a uh, part of a, um, of a group of people working with um, uh, University of New Mexico, New Mexico State or something. And um, we hunt meteors. So I've got, a, um, I've got a meteor camera up on top of my house and uh, my entire screen to share. There we go. 
And can you see my screen, guys? Uh, yes. This is this is a clip that we just got today of um, it should be a clip of. Alex, I'm gonna have to check out here for a few minutes. I may check back in here shortly. Okay. But that's uh, Starlink's going through our meteor cams. Wow. Anyway, Shahap, um, we're gonna we're gonna check out for the night. Okay. All right. Well, you all you all come back, everybody. Hap will be back in a couple of months to tell us about um, some projects he's involved with with um, uh, analyzing asteroids, and then he's going to also come back and tell us about um, what it takes to modify one of those cameras, you know, which he's sure. famous for doing. So uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, I think we're ready to go, right, Eric, Tolga, Terry, Molly. I'm ready when you guys are. Okay, Tolga, take us out. Good night, right, everybody. Good night, everybody. See you next week.